Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction and the opportunity of talking here. As is our way, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this wonderful country, pay my respects to our uncle this morning, Chika, that, uh, that uh, greeted us. Uh, he made mention of the many Aboriginal people um, that are here today, and I'd like to pay my respects to them, and I'd like to pay my respects to all of you and to your ancestors and to the journey that have allowed you to be here today. I always like to start my talks off with a, a map. Um, this is a map of Aboriginal Australia. I know a lot of you have seen it, but I'm also aware there are people in this room that have not seen this. And this map represents around about 350 different distinct languages, different groups, different tribes, in a land that's been here for a very, very long time with the people that have been here for a very, very long time. Some say 60,000 years, but as my old grandmother used to say, um, it's pretty much since the beginning of time. My grandmothers hail from Dungadi lands and Wiradjuri lands with connections to the people of the Nunanjeri in South Australia, as well as to a place called Scotland, way overseas, and into Wales. Today I'm intending to touch on a, on a few aspects. I mean, I could talk for hours, and I know I've got a whole 15 minutes, and I'm conscious that I will not steal anyone else's time. But I want to talk a little bit about history. I want to talk about some health data and statistics. I want to talk a little bit about the world of policy and health service provision and a wee bit more. So basically, we've got around about 680,000 plus Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people uh, that have been identified in the recent census um, in this country today. We know that there's about another 100,000 people that once we get the post-enumeration survey results in and the rest of that gets cleaned up. We know that most of, uh, half of the Aboriginal population is around about 22, 23 years of age, and that contrasts to the median age of other Australians of about 37. We know that most Aboriginal people live in either the urban environment or the, re or the regional environment, and about a third, and this number's reducing, live in the remote regions. This contrasts to a time in 1788 where we did a little bit of backcasting a few years ago with Richard Madden and others, and we found that the population of Aboriginal people in those days was somewhere between 750,000 and 1.5 million people. So we haven't quite reached <laughs> where we were uh, back in the day, which is a little bit unfortunate. Um, and of course, since the last census and since we've been enumerating people uh, since post-1966, uh, and there are issues with identification in the census, what we do know, though, is that more and more people are choosing to identify in census, uh, and this trend is not uh, intending to change any time soon. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people live in a mainstream environment, and what we have here is a population pyramid of uh, all Australians accepting uh, non-Indigenous uh, people. Um, and this is a population period for Aboriginal people. And of course, you know, we've got a growing uh, middle age as well, but we certainly do have a youthing population unlike the rest of Australia. Uh, this is when non-Aboriginal people die. They tend to die at the end of a long and healthy life, uh, which is a good time. Um, and this is when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people die. And this is a bit of a shock, you know, I don't know, uh, I just heard a bit of a gasp in there. And it's true, this is, this is something that we in the first world uh, should be deeply ashamed of. Uh, we're a really rich nation. Um, we do very, very well on just about every measure. But this is something that um, wakes people up in the middle of the night because we wonder, how on earth can it be so? It's 2017 and we've still got this sort of stuff lurking in our consciousness. Uh, we don't know where that goes. Um, so. I've always been interested in how it is people connect with culture and some of the things that we're asking people nowadays is how do you connect with culture? What makes you strong? What makes you resilient? And we're finding that more and more Aboriginal people today are learning their languages or speaking their languages at home. In the 1950s, people weren't permitted to speak their languages. Um, and so it's a very, very different world, which is fantastic. 20% of all of us can speak some language uh, from our countries. And uh, at the same time, a third of us in the last 12 months have felt as though we've been treated unfairly because uh, we are simply Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, we also know that the Productivity Commission in 2014 in the Indigenous Disadvantage 
uh, report basically said the household income is just over half of non-Indigenous household incomes, unemployment's about five times higher, and two-thirds of students are completing school in contrast to their non-Indigenous colleagues. We're finding that Indigenous disadvantage is so ingrained in this country, it's almost hard to try and find what, what squeaky wheel we need to move uh, to uh, try and experience that change and that movement that has been happening in other countries such as the US, Canada and New Zealand. Um, racism is one of those things that people don't like to talk about very much and it's interesting if you look at the history of Australia in the 1930s where this lovely stamp came from, Australia was terribly proud of its Aboriginal artefacts. You know, there's a boomerang, first time uh, on an Australian stamp was an Aboriginal artefact. Um, I also spent some time in the military and uh, in all of our messes, there are beautiful artefacts, boomerangs, there are symbols of Aboriginal life on many of the units, logos and, and other things that are important. So this is something that we've all, you know, been around for such a long time. And it's interesting because we're not too sure um, why people wanted to use these icons of Australia so clearly, yet at the same time, almost deny the presence of the Aboriginal people that for 60,000 years cared and catered for these things. But, you know, one of the things that I do want to ask, though, is that um, this whole idea of policy and what policy looks like in context. Um, over the years, I've been collecting policy documents, and I recently made a move from one university to another. And when I started to pack away all of my documents into the boxes to make the move, um, I ended up with about 45 boxes uh, and that was after I culled about two-thirds. So I estimated that I probably had about 700 kilos of documents that could be loosely referred to as policy. I thought I'd bring some this morning for you, and uh, I started piling up my little wheelie bag, and I just couldn't, I couldn't work out which ones I really wanted to bring so I could have a big stack next to me so I can show you what we've done in the last 10 years. I thought that might be just you know, pressing the friendship a bit too much. Anyhow, back to artefacts. Um, so... We know that at Federation a few years before these um, interesting uh, items uh, were part of the Australian kitchens and dining rooms all over the place, the Commonwealth Constitution was developed. And in the Constitution, it basically stated, in reckoning the numbers of people, census, Aboriginal natives shall not be counted. It also stated that the Commonwealth would uh, legislate for every race in Australia with the exception of Aboriginal people. And this is a power that's a residual power that still affects Aboriginal people today. The issues around how state and federal authorities deal with Aboriginal affairs is not new. Even in the day, conferences were held much like this, I suppose. Policies were made, um, and in the day, without the input of those who the policies were designed to affect. All this despite a new pride in Australia seen to be held by having the portrait of an Aboriginal person on a stamp. And it's interesting how we relate to this because those same portraits and other similar portraits were made for coins and certainly in more recent years a note. But there's a board process that offered Australia a chance to correct the historical wrong in our nation's constitution. It was a time when a lot of energy and coming together of peoples to create something new with enthusiasm and pride. At the same time, we needed to look at a few definitions then, and this is certainly something I'd like to look at right now. Much of the material on this slide was about the pre-1967 referendum, which I thought was a real turning point in the history of Australia. It's in my living memory, um, and it's certainly in the living memory of many people that I know. So I want to have a look at a couple of definitions. I think it's important that um, we understand the terms that we use when we refer to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I pick only three to have a quick yarn about, but there are a few more that we could use that include words such as partnership, collaboration. I'll start with initiative. In Aboriginal Australia, we have gazillions of initiatives. I can't even imagine. I think we've got more initiatives than we do policies. The National Audit uh, Office spoke about some of the administrivia involved with many of these initiatives recently uh, in one of its reports. In one particular grant system, there were on average 25 different financial and acquittal reports that were required for the grants. Most of the grants were about $55,000. There were even some that were less than $1,000. Can you imagine 25 different reports for 1000 bucks? Can you imagine what that would be like? 
Did the administrivia, and I don't mean to be rude, but did the administrivia burden of the reporting empower those organisations that these grants were designed to assist? Or were the rules on this reporting and transparency so overwhelming that this actually undermined what was intended? Is this the tonic for capability gaps, or a tonic for poor practice, or a tonic for corruption, or non-use of the funds in an appropriate way? And did we then go off and design a system around the deficits alone? The second word I want to talk about is consultation. Part of many funding applications, including applications to groups like the NHMRC and ARC, demand that we consult, that we consult with our community partners, that we consult with those that we're doing the research with, that we ask for letters of support, we go to board meetings and we do the do. I ask you, if things are so bad when we spend more than double per capita on programs and services for Indigenous specific programs, that our consultation is obviously not working in the way it should be. The Department of Finance and Deregulation in 2010 noted that there is a poor coordination across governments and a lack of engagement with Indigenous peoples. Now, engagement, that's an interesting word because it's different from consultation. They didn't say consultation, they said engagement. So I thought I'd have a look at that magic word engagement. And it's interesting because it's all about, you know, going off to get married, agreeing to do something together, being involved with something, or encouraging people to contribute to something bigger. Close the Gap is one of those stories, I think, in history that's almost 10 years, about 10 years old now. And it's a story of phenomenal engagement that occurred across the sector. It bought on the community controlled organisations, it bought on a lot of government bodies, it bought on states and territories, and it ended up being something very much around where um, people came together, they signed agreements, and there was a huge flurry of aspirational actions, activities, interventions, consultations. But today, nearly 10 years on, out of the seven measures that I read in the most recent report card, we are not gaining on about six, and in fact, going backwards on some. It's unfortunate that all of that enthusiasm and all of that aspiration um, has failed Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and not just us, but it's also failed all of you and all of these people across the land that put so much trust into the policy environment from whence this came. And this is what I mean. This is a gap from the, uh, this is a, um, a graph from the Northern Territory, and it shows um, from around about uh, 1967 all the way through to 2012, and it shows life expectancy. Uh, and you can see that even though life expectancy is going up in both the mainstream population, Aboriginal populations, uh, the gap's not changing, right? And someone jokingly said, and I'll, I'll repeat it here because I'm with friends, right? Yeah? Okay, so don't hold it against me. I said, do you know how we close the gap, Lise? And I said, nah, how do we close the gap? And I said, make, make white people sick. I thought that was a step too far. <laughs> And, you know, we, we can laugh at that because it is funny. Um, but at the same time, it's a hideous reality that um, what we've been doing for such a long time has not really made the difference uh, that we need to make. Um, so we've had a lot of policies and programs, and Noel Pearson recently wrote in the forward to Mark Moran, he wrote a book called Serious Whitefella Stuff. It's well worth a read. And he said, and I quote, imagine an international development worker professing to have a credible opinion about what will work to promote social and economic development in Indonesia without ever having lived there or worked on the ground with Indonesian people to help bring about change. Now, that sounds ridiculous, right? But does that sound familiar? Yeah, it does. So recently, there was a big meeting at Uluru. You might have read about it or heard about it. Many days of work on the ground in Uluru preceded by probably a hundred years of work prior, suggestions came forward. It was really, really good. We spoke to a lot of people who came home from, from that particular meeting, and there was, of course, created a Makarata statement. Unfortunately, the conversation around Makarata today, and we're only a few months on, is one of fear, and it's one where the discussion and the recommendations that were made there with so much passion and goodwill and enthusiasm by everyone that was there and now, again, sitting outside the fence. 
The government has dismissed the voice. It's now behind the screen again, as is the treaty discussions from the Commonwealth. Solid advice from Makarata is now again being dismissed. We were asked what we needed to do. People made a lot of effort to come together and engage with each other from all over Australia. And again, we've gone nowhere fast. But there are some things that work. Uh, and some of the things that work are uh, smaller programs. There are some things that have been examined that work. And what I'd like to offer very quickly um, is a, a piece of work that was done by a number of colleagues of mine and myself, where we looked at what makes programs work in context. And we went through a plethora of grants that were offered and programs that were running around Australia and chose six to do case studies of. We found after the synthesis of the six that there are four key factors, and we call them the critical success factors, the critical sustainability factors, the critical growth factors, and the critical societal factors. When we looked at the case studies in the themes, we were able to devise this particular diagram. Pictures are good, circles are great, and that seems to make sense. And what we saw in all of the programs, even though they were very diverse and very different from each other and from different parts of the country, we saw these common elements that make things happen at both the participant and program interface. On the inner ring, we call this critical success factors, we use strengths, we recognise that strengths using strong relationships that were authentic, truthful and trusting made all the difference in the world. The second ring, the critical sustainability factors, were the ways that the programs were originated in the community. They were from the ground, it's what the community wanted, and they embedded Aboriginal ways of being and doing. Part of the practice was around having a shared vision of what the program was to bring and the potential and embraced meaningful accountability and evaluation in practice. The next ring, known as the critical growth factors, showed realistic expectations in line with the many challenges that the community had, as well as being able to meet the funding expectations and the accountability measures. It's where we grow and sustain the required workforce and where they engage with other services to make meaningful connections outside of the health area. And then, of course, we come to the critical societal factors. These are the very big picture helicopter factors where we recognise and protect the critical role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have in the future of this nation, not only within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, but in the nation as a whole. And here is where we need to have those hard discussions about how do we allocate resources, how do we go about making the change that needs to get done, because quite frankly, there are just too many of us getting, you know, just over uh, having to repeat the same story all the time. Um, there's a lot more detail in that evaluation. You can certainly um, download it from line. Uh, when you have a look for it. But the key is, and what I'm trying to illustrate here, is that Aboriginal people know what works. We've known for a very, very long time, we just need you to walk with us. So when we do go walking, do we go off and do initiatives? Do we go off and do consultation? Do we do engagement or do we do something else? Well, I think the word engagement is important. Engagement for us is a process through which we bring our capabilities together with those of others to collaboratively achieve mutually co-created goals that improve well-being and produce just, equitable and sustainable outcomes for all. I don't know how many kilograms of documents on policy we've created. I don't know how many more we need to go through. But long-term relationships are key. Engaging from the start is key. Rapid translation of research and innovative work can't be hamstrung the way it has been. In other words, getting it right in my space will translate and transition to the good of us all. Thank you.